Number one. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Wonderful, the, the Israelites were led by the Lord. What a wonderful, marvelous thing. Uh, by the cloud in the daytime, when to move. By the fire at night, when to move. In the wilderness, 40 years, they moved 44 times. About the average of once every year they had to move, whether by night or by day. In Exodus 13, verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to feed, lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire. And he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. Wonderful leading of the Lord. We don't have that type of leading. We have them in scriptures, but they had an actual physical cloud and fire. In Exodus 14, 19, the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before the, their face and stood behind them. It was a cloud and a darkness to them. By the enemies, the Egyptians couldn't see it. And then in Exodus 40, verse 34, a cloud covered the tent of the, uh, the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Lord was in that cloud of the tabernacle as well. And in Numbers 9, 15, and uh, the day the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, name of the tent of testimony. So it was always the cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night. So the tabernacle was by day a cloud, by fire at night by fire. It's interesting. Then uh, it also... It talks about he passed through the sea. Uh, when I read this many years ago, I understood that there was a mountain on the left of the Israelites. They came out of Egypt, 600,000 plus women and children. On the one other side was another mountain or hill, and before them was a sea. Behind them were the Egyptians, ready to kill them. Nowhere to go. And God opened up that sea. What a wonderful miracle that was. In Exodus 14:16. Lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And Moses obeyed on that occasion, and he did it, and it was divided. Exodus 14, 22. Children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. The waters were a wall upon them on their right hand and on their left. And then Exodus 14, 28. The waters returned, covered the chariots. The Egyptians wanted to go in after them, wanted to go ahead and kill them and destroy them. But the waters returned when they were in there, covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came up into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them, completely destroyed. Then in Psalm 78, 13, David reminds us of this. He that is the Lord divided the sea, caused them to pass through, and made the waters to stand up as a heap. A lot of the modernist liberals don't believe the, the crossing of the Red Sea. They call it a Reed Sea, a lot of them. And because it was just the Reed Sea, but it's so small, you can't even walk into it. See, they want to say the Red Sea is not anything but the Reed Sea. Well, if, that, if the modernists are right, it's simply the Reed Sea. It's about two feet high. How could the Egyptians die and be drowned in the little bit of water? There's either a miracle one way or the other. Either stupid one way, they're stupid the other. But it was a big dry ground. And the Lord led them through. The host were killed in the sea. Not so much as one of them. In Psalm 1, he divided the sea. In the daytime with the cloud. And night by fire. And Isaiah, in Jeremiah, rather, Psalm 78, verse 53. The sea overwhelmed their enemies. The sea, they tried to get after Israelites. But the, the sea overwhelmed these Egyptians. In Psalm 106, verse 9. He, that is God, rebuked the Red Sea also. It was dried up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. God dried up that sea. Miracle indeed. In Psalm 136, verse 13, to him which divided the Red Sea into parts over and over again, it's mentioned the Red Sea was divided. And then in the end of that verse, verse 15, in Psalm 136, 15, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. God was faithful to the Israelites and drove out the Egyptians and killed them, but he led his people, 600,000 men plus women and children, one or two million people out of Egypt. And they were grumbling all the way. They grumbled. When they saw that Red Sea, they said, why did you bring us out here? They're going to kill us. But the Lord opened up the sea for them. But did they thank him? Did they remember his power? No. They just went ahead. We'll see it a little bit later. And uh, 
questioned and murmured against the powerful Lord. Let's read verse number two together. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. Well, I got to repeat that twice, didn't I? Uh, I don't know whether that repeats in the scripture twice, maybe just once. Does it repeat twice? Anybody got the Bible open? <laughs> verse two. Anyway, I want you to notice that word. In what way were they baptized? Well, the cloud completely overwhelmed them, completely took them in, the whole thing. They enveloped them, not sprinkling or pouring. Baptism means to dip and to sprinkle. And also in the sea, all the bits of parts of the sea, they went right down into the middle of the sea. That's baptizing. That's baptizing. That's sprinkling or pouring. And that's why the word is used, completely enveloped in the cloud, completely enveloped in the sea. That's true, they didn't, she didn't wash over them and kill them, but they went through that and the cloud was over them. That's why they use that word, baptized. And that's an important word. I know a lot of people don't believe in baptism by immersion. They think it means just pouring or sprinkling, something like that, uh, a little sprinkle of water. But uh, the scriptures are clear. If you look in the Old Testament, uh, where the word bapto is used, it's used in meaning to, to immerse. It's what it means to dip into. And that's what the, the scriptural picture is. Buried with him in baptism, by we raised by the power of God to a newness of life. Let's read verse number four together. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. A lot of people have wondered about this. If that rock was Christ, spiritual rock, did he follow them? Did the rock follow them? Well, certainly the Lord Jesus Christ followed them. And maybe this rock followed too. I don't know. The Lord is able to do anything, you know. They were in there for 40 years, and they were without any water. I don't know how many rocks were in the desert. I don't know how many rocks they could find. Maybe the Lord Jesus did follow them, and by miraculous power, set up these rocks. And uh, we'll see about the rock, Christ Jesus. He is the rock, called the rock. He's stable. He's permanent. He doesn't drift. He doesn't go different places, different times. He's the same Yesterday, today, and forever. Always the same. In Exodus 17 and verse 6, God told Moses, Behold, he said, I will stand before thee there upon the rock, it's another rock, in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He obeyed God, and he smote the rock. You know, see, later on, God said, speak to the rock, and he didn't. He struck it twice and was angry at the people. Must we bring forth water, you people? Very angry. Because of that sin, Moses committed the sin unto physical death. And Aaron did too, because must we bring? Aaron was right there with him. And God slew Aaron, the sin of sin of physical death. He slew Moses later on, a number of years later, and both of them committed the sin of the physical death. But here he obeyed God and struck the rock because God told him to strike the rock and water came out. In Numbers 20, in verse 8, Take the rod, God told Moses, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye to the rock before their eyes, and it shall bring forth water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, as thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Here's what Moses did on that occasion. We mentioned earlier. Moses took the rod from before the Lord. Now God said, take the rod. He didn't say use the rod. He said, take the rod. So Moses got his, got his rod. See, gather thou the assembly together, thou and there thy brother. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Well, he's all right so far. God said, take the rod. He took the rod. Good. 100%. A. A plus. But in verse number 10, Moses and Aaron, both of the brothers, Aaron was 183 when he died, and Moses was 100, 180 when he died. Three years older Aaron was than Moses. Moses and Aaron together gathered the congregation together. See, they were thirsty. They cried unto Moses, give us drink, we're thirsty in this wilderness. Gather the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Moses, hear now ye rebels. Now did God tell him to call them rebels? Well, God didn't tell them to call these people rebels. They were rebels. He just said, speak to the rock and bring forth water. Here you know, you rebels. Then he said, must we fetch? Moses and Aaron couldn't fetch anything out of any rock. But must we? 
He's taking credit for himself. The sin and the physical death. A person asked me the other day, what does that mean in 1 John chapter 5? There's a sin and the death. I pray not to say that you pray for that. There's other sins you pray for, but that, the sin and the death, don't pray for that. I explained. Uh, the people that committed sin unto death, they didn't mention Moses and Aaron, but they committed sin unto physical death. Uh, I talked about uh, Nadab and Abihu when they lied before the Lord. Of course, they were, had, the, had the wrong incense before the Lord committed sin unto death. And uh, the people in the, first, in the New Testament, uh, what were their names? And I saw fire. See, they'd lied before the Lord. They committed a sin unto physical death. Here, Moses and Aaron both committed sin of physical death, must we fetch water out of this rock? God didn't tell him to say that. Taking a glory for it. And then the next verse, verse 11, Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. Wait a minute, God didn't say take your rod. He said, speak to the rock, very clear. <coughs> with his rod, he smote the rock. Not once, but twice. The water came forth abundantly. God still answered the needs of the people. And the congregation drank and their beasts also. And then the Lord told him something they should hear. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. Both of them were guilty of this sin unto physical death. Aaron was in on it. He didn't tell Moses, wait a minute, Moses. He didn't stop the rod from being smitten. He didn't hold back the rod. He just let him go. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in verse 11 of this chapter 20 of Numbers. Because ye believe me not. Ye, only the King James would tell us that was plural. Moses and Aaron. They would just say, because you did this, because you did this, meaning only Moses. No, Moses and Aaron, because ye, or both of them, believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye, both of you, shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given unto them. Sad thing, Moses' disobedience. A great leader for many years, Got near the end of time, near the 40th year, 39th year, and he, he, let, he let the Lord down. May we learn that lesson from Moses. When we get to the years of our life, no matter how many years we've been a Christian, we still can fall like Moses. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 15 talks about who led thee through the great terrible wilderness and, and through drought where there was no water, who brought forth water out of the rock of flint. In Psalm 78 and verse 12, marvelous things did he in the sight of our fathers. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through, and made the waters to stand up as a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud, in the night with a light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down the rivers. Modernists don't believe any of that. They say it's trash, it's no good. God performed these miracles just like he made the heavens and the earth and all the people, the insects, and the beasts, and the animals. We believe God. And the Bible is clearly true. Whereas despite the apostate unbelievers that don't deny it. In Psalm 105, verse 38, Egypt was glad when they departed. They were glad to see him, but they weren't so glad after they found out they no more workers, no more slave labor to build their pyramids. So they went after them, tried to get them. God destroyed them. They were glad when they departed. He spread a cloud over for a covering, the Lord did, and a fire to give light by night. He opened the rock, and the waters gushed out. They ran in the dry places like a river. God supplied the need of his people. Praise God for it. Let's read verse number 5 together. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in their wilderness. <clears throat> My friends, we read in Deuteronomy 26, 63, and 64 today in our Bible reading. I've been reading the Bible through ever since I've been a new Christian. I was saved in October 1944. In January, or that's actually December 31st of 1944, our pastor, Pastor Willett, said, I want everyone in this church, before this next year is over, to read their Bible through Genesis to Revelation. And I didn't know how much to do it, but I finally got 85 verses per day. We'll take you through the Bible in a year. 85 verses per day, and so I began, I read it, and that was January 1945. By December of this year, 2016, I will have read it 70 years ago, 70 years ago, I read it once a year, in fact, the first couple of years I read it twice a year, I read it over 70 times, 
but I never saw this in the scripture till I read it today. With many of them, God was not well pleased. Really, with none of them was God well pleased. It says in Numbers 20, I know that they started out, Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that came through and lived to go ahead and enter the land. But I know that they started out with 603,000 plus, ended up with 601,000. I just saw, well, God decimated them. He killed a few of them. But when I read Numbers 26, 63, and 64, I found out something completely different. Never had seen it before in 70 years. So you say, why continue to read the Bible? Because you'll learn something every time you read it. You're a different person. Let me read Numbers 26, 8, 63. These are they which were numbered by Moses and Eleazar, the priests, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. And 61,000, that's near the one Moses and Eliezer. Now notice in verse 64 of Numbers 26. But among these, that is, were numbered by Moses and Eliezer uh, during the book of Numbers, of these, there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered at the beginning of the time, when there were 603,000 plus, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Every single one of the 603,000 men were slaughtered and killed by the Lord for sin. 603,000. They remembered that before. Every one of them. When Moses and Aaron numbered the people, 603,000, then they were 40 years in the wilderness. The end of the wilderness, they numbered them again. Moses and his oldest son who was living, Eliezer, numbered them. They were only 601,000. I thought, well, they just decimated about 2,000 or so. But the fact of it is, every one of those 601,000 were brand new people. 19 years and under, teenagers and under, were spared. And every one of those oldsters, every one of them, not a single one, except these two people, Caleb and Joshua, the only ones that went through and spared. It's an amazing thing. As many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. That's right, overthrown. Every one of them was overthrown. Let's read verse number six together. Now these things were all examples to the intent to not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Examples. The message this morning is titled, uh, Take Heed and Have a Need to Take Heed to Examples. We have examples a little bit later in verse 11, but here's some right here. Uh, we shouldn't lust after other things. Now, examples can either be good or bad. We know that. They're good examples. They're bad examples. Well, can't we learn from both? We ought to learn from bad examples as well as good examples. Bad examples, stay away from them. Good examples, follow them. And so here's, these were our examples to the intent that we should not lust. These were the bad examples. Don't lust after these evil things as they lusted. In Psalm 78, verse 18, they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. You know, they wanted quails. God gave them the quails. And they were, while they were eating them, he killed them. They, they were just horrible. They just gloved themselves. They lusted for, for flesh. In Psalm 78 and verse 30, they were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, that's when they asked for quails, our soul loatheth this light bread. Weren't satisfied with manna. God gave them manna, nutrition, nutritionist manna, nutrition, whatever that word is, nutrition, nutritious, 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 Manna. I'm sure it had everything in it just for the people. It said our, lo our soul loathed this light bread. It was like coriander seed. It was white. It was wonderful. Uh, we want some from quail, some meat. While they were strange in their lust, while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them. Wow. Not the skinny ones. The fattest of them, they wanted more and more and more and more, and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this, they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. They did not learn their example. It continues sin. In Galatians 5.16, God tells us today, walk in the spirit and ye shall what? Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then in 1 John 2, 16 and 17, we know that one. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Tremendous. We've got to be careful about these bad examples. Let's read verse number 7 together. 
Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Now this is a negative prohibition. Neither be ye idolaters. Negative prohibition. We said many times before, if it's a negative prohibition in the aorist tense in the Greek, don't even begin to do something. If it's a present tense prohibition, stop an action already in progress. This is present prohibition. He says, stop being idolaters, always worshiping idols, things you can see, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is when Moses went up to the mount for 40 days. In Exodus 32, when people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which will go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, a great leader, wasn't he? Break off the golden earrings, which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. Apparently the men had earrings in those days too, some day too today, which is not good anyway. Break off the things and bring them unto me. Aaron said, I gotta have all the golden earrings. Bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. He was a craftsman, wasn't he? After he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord, a feast of this idol. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, rose up to play. Wicked, sinful play, I'm sure. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down. He was up in Mount Moriah, up, up at that, uh, what is it, Mount Sinai, excuse me, not Moriah, Sinai. And the Lord said, Get thee down. Why? For thy people, which thou brought us up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. You wouldn't think that for 40 days the people are supposed to do what's right just because the leader was gone. They corrupted themselves. People do it today. They do it all the time. Corrupt themselves. Don't follow the leaders. And get thee down. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a gold, molten calf, have worshipped it, have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Well, you know the answer to that when God challenged Aaron, well, why did you do this? You know what he said. <laughs> ah, there was, it just, I put it on, it just came out a calf. It just came out a calf. Automatically, that's what Aaron said. What a liar he was. He fashioned it, he knew the whole thing. Wicked Aaron, which points out to the fact that just because God called certain people, Moses, he called Moses, called Aaron, called the priests, Eliezer and Ithamar, uh, no date, date, habit, Abihu, doesn't mean they're God's people that must stay true. They fail him all the time. All the time these people fail. But yet God chose them, wanted a certain purpose, but they didn't follow the purpose. They rose up to play. Let's read verse number 8 together. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell that day 23,000. 23,000. Uh, when the idolatry was there, uh, Moses, or rather Balaam, the council of Balaam, they were taught to worship Baal Peor. And Moses came unto the judges, slay every one of them meant that are joined into Baal Peor. There's a terrible idolatry there. He said, stop it. Uh, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. And uh, Aaron, the son of Aaron, Eliezer, took a javelin in his hand, went in, after the man of Israel into the tent, and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. That particular fornication idolatry was 24,000 God slew because of the plague of idolatry. Terrible thing. Fornication. Stop it. As some of them had committed. 23,000 and 24,000. Let's read verse number 8, or rather number 9 together. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the servants. So as again, it's a present prohibition. Stop an action already in progress. Stop tempting 
testing the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had to tell these Corinthian Christians they had enough problems. They had to tell them even more and more to stop what they're doing. Uh, these serpents were destroyers. In Numbers 21, in verse 1, uh, the king Ahad, the Canaanite, dwelt in the south, and going down to uh, verse uh, number 5, and the people spake against Moses and against uh, God. Wherefore have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For you were, there's no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. See, they called it light bread, the manna. And what did the Lord do? Because they were tempted and, and because they were tempting, testing the Lord. The Lord sent them fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. They finally got through to their mind that we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us killing serpents, poisonous serpents. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said this unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, serpent of brass, and shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh there upon it, shall live. There's no hyper-Calvinism here. Everyone that's bitten, not simply the elect, the ones that are bitten, but everyone that's bitten. That's true. Everyone that's bitten, and so Moses made a fiery serpent and set it upon the pole. And he made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, in the past that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld it, he lived. He beheld it. Uh, that's the verse taken in John 3, 14 to 16, that Uncle Charlie Allen told me has led me to Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believed in him might have eternal life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He told me about this verse, Moses lifting up the serpent, and trust in Christ, just as the Lord Jesus was lifted up on the cross, but you've got to look to him, you've got to trust in him, you've got to accept him to be saved, to take your sins away, to escape the fiery hell. And damnation must be just like these serpents. Whosoever is bitten, and all of us are bitten by sin, we've got to look to the Savior like they had to look to the serpent. A lot of them didn't look, I'm sure. And they died. But the ones that looked were spared their life. And so those that look in faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior are saved and go to heaven. Those that refuse to look, I don't believe in that garbage, they say. Their place is the fiery lake of fire in hell. Sad indeed. Stupid people. Not to believe the Word of God. Not to trust the Word of God and look to the Savior. They don't even believe there's a hell. They, get, they escape their desire, their, their need to trust Christ by saying, well, there's no such thing as hell. I'm not going there. It doesn't even exist. I'm going to burn up my body in cremation. I'm going to send it over the sea. God will never find me there. Oh, you don't think so? You don't think God can take things out of dust and ashes? He took dust of the earth and made Adam, didn't he? We believe that scripture. He's able to take the dust and bring it back. Let's read verse number 10 together. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. That's again a present prohibition. Stop your murmuring. Stop your murmuring. That's an automatopoeia, isn't it? Murmur. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Sounds like it is. Sounds like it is. Uh, in the murmurings of Israel and others, in Exodus 15, 24, the people murmured against Moses. They complained. What shall we drink? In Exodus 16, 2, the congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, both of them now in the wilderness. In Numbers 14.2, all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. In Numbers 14.27, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? The Lord asked the people of the Israelites, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. God hears our murmurings. Other people don't know it, but God knows everything about it. In Numbers 16, on the morrow, the congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. You have killed the people of the Lord. And Psalm 108, verse 25, talks about Israelites. They murmured in their tents, murmured in their tents, and hearkened not to the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. The New Testament, for believers, born again Christians, saved believers, Paul wrote in from jail. 
and I'm sure he had plenty of cause to murmur. Shackled in hands, shackled in feet, no food for me to speak of, no conditions that were good, the hard, dank, cold. He wrote to the Christians at Philippi and he said, do all things. Even if you get put in prison, if we get put in prison, the FEMA camps, we must remain the same way. We do all things without murmurings, without disputings. It's an important thing. Christians murmur too, you know. If you don't believe it, just, just listen to some of them sometimes. All right. And then in Jude verse 16, Jude 1 16, these are murmurers. Speaking of the false teachers of Jude's day, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak of great swelling words. These are the modernist apostates today. Swelling words, great big long words that the congregation, many of them don't even understand. But they're so big, they love, must be wonderful. I told you many times about that woman. <laughs> she got out of the service. So a wonderful sermon. And then she said, I didn't understand a word he said. But it's a wonderful sermon because it's got big words. See, terrible. People worship big words. Murmurs, great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And people today have people in, with admiration for advantage to them. They speak up for this man, this man took advantage of them. Let's read verse number 11 together. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. All these things, all these experiences of the Israelites, for us, he's writing to the Corinthians, and by application to us even today, in samples, examples, for our admonition, our warning, upon the ends of the world to come. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, you be followers of me, because he follows the Lord. Mark them that walk so as you have us for an ensample. We, the title of the message was, we must take heed, the need to heed examples. Follow the Apostle Paul as he followed the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4, He that are ensamples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, he commended those at Thessalonica. They were examples and ensamples to all that believe. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 9, uh, to, not because we have not the power to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Make ourselves an example. We have the power to make ourselves an example. We should follow Paul as Paul, Paul followed the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 5, and verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage. Talking about the pastors, bishops, elders in 1 Peter 5. Don't be lords and masters over God's heritage, the people that you're serving, but being samples to the flock. Pastors, bishops, elders got to be samples to the flock. Many of them aren't, but they should be, we should be. In 2 Peter 2, in verse 6, under the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, here's a bad example, under the ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, God did. And yet sodomy is practiced today, and the president loves it. He's a sodomite himself. He's a homosexual himself for years and years and years, Chicago. Uh, and he's making wonderful, wonderful waves. Let's have everybody, all the states, no longer can say marriages by husband, by a man and a woman. But an example of Sodom and Gomorrah, what did God do to them? He might made, condemned them into ashes with an overthrow. Everyone except Lot and his wife came out and she wasn't killed because she looked back, but his two daughters overthrow, making them an example unto those that shall afterwards live ungodly. When is God going to rain fire and brimstone upon the United States of America and the rest of the world that's honoring sodomy and homosexuality? I wonder. There's some other verses, good and bad, that have to do with not end samples, but examples. That's the same word, example, end sample. But examples in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. You know this one perhaps. Now these things were our examples then we should not be intent that we should not lust after these things as they also lust examples. Bad examples to follow not, to follow not. Bad examples don't follow, good examples follow. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. Pastor Timothy was a pastor at Ephesus. Paul told Pastor Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. He's a younger man than Paul, maybe 10 years younger, 15 years, how many years, we don't know. But be thou an example of the believers. That pastor had to be an example. Paul said, you've got to be an example, a good example, to follow that. We must take heed to follow good example. The need to take heed. B. 
Be thou examples of the believers. In what ways? Well, Paul told them exactly. In word, what you're speaking about. Conversation, that's your manner of life. In charity and love. In spirit. In faith. In purity. All these areas of example that Pastor Bishop Bowles must be to this flock. That's in Scripture. And in Hebrews 4 and verse 11, Paul said to the Hebrew Christians, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Example of unbelief. The Israelites had an example, a bad example of unbelief, so watch that. It's a bad example and avoid it. In Hebrews 6, or chapter 8, in verse 5, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. Talks about the, the, the tabernacle. It's an example of heavenly things. There's a heavenly tabernacle. And so the Lord Jesus is the heavenly tabernacle and the heavenly high priest. In James 5 and verse 10, here's another example. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example. Oh, why? What were they example of? Three things. Example of suffering. And you and I may suffer. We've already suffered, some of us through the years, in different ways, not maybe as much as others, but we have suffered. Prophets are an example of suffering. What's the second thing? Example of affliction. Affliction. We'll get it. We may get it. And what's the next one? The third one is a positive example. Patience. Patience. In all the affliction, and all the trouble, and all the heartache, and all the pain, we must be patient. Patient. And that's the example of the prophets. And then in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, even here until you were called, because Christ also suffered up for us, suffered for us in our behalf, all the whole world, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, helping others, suffering maybe, follow his example for us. And then Jude 7. We read this, I think, before. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities round about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, that is sodomy, homosexuality, going after strange flesh, probably bestiality as well, having sex with beasts and animals, are set forth an example, a bad example. And our country is, a, is following Sodom and Gomorrah in this bad example. Sodomy is fine. It's great. Bestiality is fine. They're going to write that into the Universal Code of Military Justice, UCMJ. They're going to write in. They've already written in. You can be a sodomite and be in the military. When I was a chaplain, Navy chaplain, five years in active duty, no sodomites were there. You find a sodomite, he's out. Now, don't say, don't talk, don't say, don't say. But now, you're invited. And the sodomites are sodomizing fellow men in the military. Many of them. An example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Eternal fire. In fact, the USMJ is going to write in also that they're going to have sex with beasts. Bestiality is going to be written in the Universal Code of Military Justice. Perversion from top to bottom. The most perverted person in the world is our president, the leader, supposedly. He's a leader, all right. And one of the ways he's leading, he's a leader in lying. He's a leader in deceiving. He's a leader in fornication and homosexuality. Many things he's a leader in. As far as they're written for our admonition, all these things happen and written for our admonition, our learning. In Exodus or Ephesians 6 and verse 4, you fathers provoke not, provoke not your children to wrath. How are we supposed to treat our children? Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And nurture, that's with a paddle, that's, a, that's a, discipline as needed, only when they need it, but every time they need it. And admonition, that's the talking. You talk, you tell them. But you have the discipline as well. And that again has been outlawed in many states. Spanking of the children, discipline of the children. That's outlawed. It's a horrible thing. But God tells us we're to bring them up in two ways. Nurture, that's discipline, and admonition, that's talking. In Titus 3 and verse 10, talking about admonition, a man that is a heretic against the scriptures, the word of God, after the first and second admonition, reject, reject. Kick him out. He's no good. Let's read verse number 12 together. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Take heed. That word is blepo. That word is blepo. 
And that word take heed is a very important word. It's a, it's a cautious word. It's a word that every one of us must understand. It means to look and discern, perceive, and to discern mentally and observe, to turn the thoughts and direct the mind to something, to contemplate. Uh, lest he fall, take heed. That's a continuous action, continuous to take heed. Uh, as you think, if you continue to think, well, I'm not going to fall. That's for pastor and people alike, and missionaries and all the evangelists, every one of us. God says, let him that thinketh continue to think, oh, I'm not going to fall. I'm wonderful. None of us are wonderful. All of us are sinners, saved sinners or lost sinners, but all of us are sinners, either saved or lost. Thinketh he stand, continuously take heed. Lest he fall, pipto, fall under judgment, come under condemnation, to descend from an erect to a prostrate position. Uh, the various words on take heed in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 9, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things that thine eyes have seen. Lest thou depart from thy, thy heart, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. We read that this morning in our Bible reading, Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Our sons are important. Our sons' sons, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are important. We can't, once they leave the house, there's nothing we can do. We pray for them, and we do pray for them. Pray for our, all of our children and their children, our, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. Pray for them every day. Pass it on. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 6, this is the second giving of Dutra Namas. Deuteronomy 2nd, Namas is law, the second giving of the law. God slew every one of the 603,000, 603,000 of them. They didn't hear all this. So God said, I want you to write another book, special book. I want you to speak to these 19-year-olds and below that didn't know all these things. I want you to tell them how the Lord raised up and brought these people through the world. So that's what Deuteronomy is. It's a rehearsal for those that are still living what God has done in the past, and they didn't even know about some of these things. Take heed. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. In Malachi 2, verse 15, therefore take heed to your spirit. That's not just the body, the spirit. That none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth, treacherously against his wife. Matthew 24, 4, the Lord Jesus answered and said, take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed, be careful. Deceptions all around us. People say one thing and it's a lie. I heard the other day somebody from the, from the people running for office, he said, that guy, $200 million. Father gave him $200 million. What a lie. He didn't care. What a deception. The father gave him a million. And the father loaned him and he paid it all back. Lies, deceit. But be careful. That you'd hardly, and people believe everything they hear on this boob tube and everything here on the internet, everything on the, the, the television. It's a terrible situation. God says, take heed lest your heart be deceived. Let heart not be deceived. We've got to know the truth. We can't listen to all these things. Some of the things that they say are true, but they're mixed in with lies and deception. Malachi 2 and verse 15. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that none deal treacherously against the wife and take heed to no man deceive you in Matthew 24. Then in Luke 12 and verse 15. Lord Jesus, again, take heed. Beware of covetousness. I want some more and more and more and more. For a man's life, here's an example of what a man's life really consists of in the Lord Jesus' view. A man or a woman's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what God considers a person's life, the abundance of our possessions. Because what's going to happen to the possession when we die? They're all going to go, they're going to stay right here on this earth. Either go to the government or the family, whoever steals them the most or gets the most. So a man's heart, a man's life. Uh, then in Acts 20, verse 28, another take heed. He told, Paul told the church, the pastors, the bishops, the elders at Ephesus, you leaders, take heed unto yourselves. That's number one. If a pastor, bishop, elder doesn't take heed to himself, He's not going to be a good pastor and bishop elder. To yourselves, and take heed to all the flock, all the people over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the flock. Feed the flock. Shepherd the flock. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Then in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, 
Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. We have Christ as the foundation. Another buildeth thereupon. The illustration. But let every man take heed how he build. How we build upon the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Very important. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to thy doctrine. Timothy is a pastor at Ephesus. And Paul says, you've got to take heed to yourself first. And secondly, to your doctrine. What do you believe? The teachings. Continue in them. For in so doing, thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee as well. These are things that we've got to see. Let's read verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, will not suffer you to be attempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear. God will make a way to escape regardless. And then verse 14, let's read that. Wherefore, my delirious beloved, flee from idolatry. Things that we can see, flee from it. God does not want us to look and see the things that we see. And right, let's read verse 15. I speak as a wise man, judge me what I say. I hope the Corinthians were wise. I hope all of us are wise. Paul thought they were. And then in verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The believers in communion service, it's a ministry, it's a message concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his death. It doesn't become his body, as the Catholics falsely say. It doesn't become his blood, but it's for him. Let's read verse 17 together. For ye being many are one bread and one body, but we are all partakers of that one bread. Speaking of the genuine Christians, all partakers of that one bread. I have to stop right here. I didn't take too much of the last three verses because I got talking too much on other things. <laughs> but let's close. And a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank Thee for these words. We thank Thee that we can read the Old Testament, which are given for us to read for examples. We should not follow these evil things, and we should follow the good things. So give us intent, Lord, to read Thy Word, to study Thy Word. Help us, those who are genuine Christians. We have the flesh that wants to sin. We have the Holy Spirit within us who wants us to live peaceably and rightly and to serve our Savior. So guide us, Lord, and help us to follow and walk the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If there be any there who are not saved today, that our service, may they come to our Savior and receive Him, lest they go to the fiery place of hell. Guide us and direct those that are saved to live to please Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymnals again. And turn to hymn number 284. 284. Some golden daybreak. Let's read the verse together. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 284.
Thank you for coming. Join us at Wednesday if you can. Come back at 1.30 for our...